All right, good afternoon, folks. <clears throat> so I'm not sure how long uh, today's lecture is going to be. It's probably, my, my, my guess is it'll probably be a bit shorter than uh, some of our previous ones. Uh, I'm sort of focusing on, on one aspect uh, uh, today, and, it, and it's sort of setting up for the spawning of, of enemies. So we're not going to fill out any sort, of, any sort of enemy stuff today. We will create their, their class, but they're going to be there just so our uh, sort of main focus today will, will work correctly. So they'll basically just be empty classes for now until we add stuff to them uh, probably a, a bit next week. So uh, the, the introduction here uh, will be a bit about a design pattern that, that I don't think I've talked about before. The, uh, some of you may, may have seen this before. Uh, it's, it, 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 it's possible this is, this is going to be what's known as a factory pattern. Uh, some other names for it, uh, like, like, or like uh, fac factory method pattern um, uh, or, or simple factory, they, they sort of all have their, uh, their, their specific sort of use cases for the specific terminology. Uh, I usually just call it the factory pattern, whether or not it's a simple, simple factory or one of the more complicated ones. <clears throat> and this is what we're going to use to spawn our enemies. It's, you know, UML diagram wise, it's, it's not that complicated. It's essentially just a concrete factory that has some function called produce. So you, so you, you, you call this factory, whatever your factory's name is, enemy factory dot produce, and that gives you an enemy. So at a fundamental level, it's not a whole lot different than when we call instantiate from the Unity API. But what this is going to let us do, what this sort of style of of, uh, of design pattern is going to let us do is some more of this separation between the coupling of our classes. Because we will have a spawn manager, and that spawn manager will spawn enemies. But we're going to push some of that responsibility off to the factory itself. So the typical, typical sort of factory pattern has, has a few parts. It has an interface, so that's what this represents here. The stuff in my in my diagrams here, I is an interface, C is a, a concrete class. Uh, you know, later on we might see A for an abstract class. So we have an interface I factory, and we'll we'll talk about the I a, a little bit later. But interface called I factory, and it has one abstract function called produce, and that returns an I product. So a factory returns a product. Or it produces a product. So then you create a concrete factory that implements iFactory. And so that means you have to have produce uh, along with any other th stuff you want. You can put whatever you want to inside, the, in, inside our concrete factory, but it has to have produce. And then we have a concrete product. Now, rather than just think of these as a concrete product and a concrete factory, let's, let's be a more specific. Let's say an enemy factory and a melee enemy and a ranged enemy. So we might have lots of different products that the factory can produce. So the enemy factory might be able to produce ranged enemies and melee enemies and boss enemies and whatever other kind of enemies we have. But those need to be, or those need to implement I product. So that's what, the, that's what this, this diagram is sort of showing us here, that concrete factories are I factories and concrete products are I products and concrete factories produce concrete products. That's what the diagram looks like. If you go look up a simple factory or factory method pattern online, you'll see something similar to this. All of the spawn logic is going to take place within the factory itself. So spawn manager will never actually call instantiate. Spawn manager is not really even going to know the specific <clears throat> the specific type of enemy that was spawned. So we're going to have some decoupling happening. The spawn manager is only going to tell the factory, I need a product. And the factory, through its logic, determines what enemy gets spawned, and it sends it back. So this decoupling is going to lend itself to a lot of flexibility. So that's something that we'll sort of talk about uh, today and as as we go on further we'll be like oh if because of our factory we can do this later on in some of our code so all of the benefits might not be sort of apparent with the stuff that we write today 
but as we go on, hopefully we'll become more clear as to why this is why this is useful. So the overall code that we're going to write today is just just related to these sort of four classes. And they are very simple. The two interfaces are, are very simple. The concrete factory is, is going to be you handle a little bit of logic and the products are going to be our enemies, which we're not going to fill in today. So there's not a lot of code to write, but it gives us a framework for uh, some flexible code uh, in the future. So again, the idea is that the concrete factory creates an I product. And that concrete product, whatever it happens to be, must implement I product. So we, we are going to use this sort of terminology as well, I product and, and I factory. Uh, and for now, anyway, and, and we'll sort of talk about this later on, I product is actually just going to be empty. It's not going to have any functions at all in it, at least, at least for now. So to set this stuff up first, let's create two interfaces. These aren't related to mono behavior in any way. So these are just regular uh, C-sharp interfaces. So you can think of them the same way as you think of an interface in, in, in Java. All they have is a essentially what, what you call in C or C++ is just a function prototype. So just a, uh, an, an, an abstract function. Uh, oftentimes, especially in Unity, you will see I as the first letter of an interface. So that's why it's I product and I factory. That way it's clear right away when you're looking at, uh, at, at some code that implements interfaces, it's clear that those are interfaces. And something else that doesn't have an I would be a, say, an abstract class or, or a class that you're inheriting from. So this is a convention in a lot of places. Uh, so you will see this sort of I in, in different places, especially in Unity. Anything you see that starts with a capital I, that is an interface. So we'll sort of continue following that, uh, that, that convention. So let's add these two. To our uh, to our project. So in my uh, in my scripts folder, I'm just going to create a new C# -sharp script, and this one will be i factory, and I'm going to create i product as well. And we can open them up. I product. I don't need any of this stuff. I don't need the mono behavior stuff at all. And I'm going to change the class from class to interface. So got my interface and same for factory. I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to delete everything inside, get rid of all the mono behavior stuff, and do interface. For the factory, though, it is going to have that function that returns an iProduct, and it's going to be called produce. So any factory, any factory that implements this interface must have that produce function. So uh, so far, this, this this shouldn't be anything sort of sort of weird. You know, we we did this sort of stuff in uh, in in Java before. Hopefully, you've messed around with uh, interfaces uh, before doing some other projects or in other classes or something. Meanwhile, I product is just going to stay empty. We may use it and change stuff at at some point later on. Uh, it's not too important, but it does ha having it empty does have a consequence a bit, a bit later on that uh, we may want to remedy. So that's something that I'll mention when we actually write our spawner or, or fill out our spawner class. This is not the only way to go about doing some interface stuff in, in Unity. When we do our AI movement, we will use an interface as well. So this is not the last you're going to see of, of interfaces. So we'll do an interface for some AI movement, and we'll actually require a component that implements that interface on some one of our game objects. So we will do some more complicated stuff with interfaces, but we're not going to do that for this particular one. And uh, Nick, yeah, so here is uh, Factory. All right, so I'm going to make a concrete factory now. So I have this, this, this is basically two full pieces of the diagram that, that I showed at the beginning. So let's make a concrete factory. So in, uh, in my project or in my, uh, uh, in my scripts folder, I'll open up this to compile, I'm going to create another C sharp script and this will be enemy factory. So this is my concrete factory, the one that needs to implement I factory. So I'm gonna open this one. We are going to make it so this one is not a mono behavior. 
we could have this be a mono behavior. And in some situations, that might be better to do. So again, I'm going to show you it a specific way for the factory. And I'm going to show you a different way where we do use mono behaviors for the AI movement. But they're essentially interchangeable. So you could make this a mono behavior. And for the most part, the stuff that we're going to do is going to look roughly the same. But all I'm going to do with our enemy factory is it will be a regular class, but it implements iFactory. Now, of course, I have an error because it needs to implement produce. So let's write that function in. So I'm going to say public iProduct produce. And then this course will have to return an iProduct. So eventually, this will return an instantiated product. Or effectively, it's going to return a game object uh, in the future. For now, I'm just going to leave it. So we, we do have the error here. But uh, for now, I'm going to leave it because we have a few more slides to go over before we start really filling this in. So this is pretty close to what we need for that third class, that concrete factory class. Uh, very, very simple. Hopefully, hopefully this, this, this uh, uh, makes, makes sense for most folks. Back to the slides. Here it is. So this is going to return our enemy instance. And of course, whenever we want to spawn an enemy, we simply call whatever factory we're using dot produce. And that will give us back a product, which in this case will be an enemy. And then, like I mentioned when I first created, it could also be a mono behavior, but for now we're going to use it as just a regular class. Now, there's a little bit more setup. We need to create some classes for our enemy, the thing that we will be sending or spawning in this, uh, in our spawn manager eventually, and in the factory itself. So I'm going to set it up this way. We have an abstract enemy class that is a mono behavior and it is an I product as well. So every enemy is a product and it's a mono behavior. And it's a mono behavior because I want to add this, the one of these scripts, one of my concrete enemies to a game object. So we're gonna have a melee enemy and a ranged enemy. Those will be our two different types for this, for this game. We'll also have, we'll have a boss also, but that, that'll, that'll come later. And these inherit from enemy. And because they inherit from enemy, they are mono behaviors and they are products. So these would be the, 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 the enemy, the melee enemy, and the ranged enemy would be our concrete products in the UML diagram that I showed you earlier. So those would be the two different products that we can have created in our factory. So I'm going to create these three. They're just going to be empty. So it's just getting the sort of classes set up and so that they exist uh, so that we can uh, not have errors when we start messing around in the actual produce uh, function in our factory itself. So back in here, we'll create C sharp scripts, and I'm going to call this one enemy. And we'll have a ranged enemy and a melee enemy. So I'll go into enemy first. So this is going to be an abstract class. So we're never going to directly attach this to any game objects. And this is going to be an I product. And we can delete. Actually, we could probably just leave the stuff in here. You, you, you can delete it. We'll use some of the start. And I think, I think we'll just use start. We're not going to use update in here. But we will use start uh, in, in this class. So you can just leave these if, if you want to. We'll mess around with them when we actually fill in our, our enemy class. For the rest of these, uh, so for our melee enemy, that's going to inherit from enemy. And it'll be our concrete class. And same way with our ranged enemy, it will inherit from enemy. Now, as you, as you might imagine, based on the, the sort of structure of this, enemy is going to have most of the code. So it'll have things like, uh, I'll have to, to see, it'll have things like uh, public game objects. Uh, player and stuff like that. So the enemy's going to know where the player is so we can chase them. You know? So it'll, it'll have all that kind of stuff uh, in it. And then the 
melee enemy and the ranged enemy will have some specific uh, specific overrides in here so that, for example, uh, you might have the, may, the ranged enemy move to a certain distance of the player and then stop and shoot from a distance, whereas the melee enemy might continually chase the player down. So some of those differences will be in the specific concrete class code itself, whereas the enemy code will be sort of its, its own thing. Uh, Nick, yes, you could play the, place these into a separate folder because this, uh, the amount of scripts that we're going to have will start to get, uh, it will, stuff will start to get get, get a bit cluttered because we're going to have, we're going to have like an interface for some of the AI stuff as well as a couple of classes and we're going to have a boss enemy that, that comes into this. So yes, oftentimes, especially if you have multiple classes that are related to each other, like our sort of interface stuff and our enemies, then putting them in a separate folder would be a very good idea because we're going to end up with, I don't know, somewhere around 20 scripts or 25 scripts in this in this particular project. So organizing them out is probably a, a good idea. Uh, yeah, my, my error down here is related to produce, not uh, returning anything. So it's not, it's not an issue uh, uh, yet because we need to fill that in. So none of these are particularly complicated. It's just, it's just we need to make sure that uh, we have them available so that we don't get a whole bunch of errors once we start trying to fill in our enemy factory itself. So sometimes just outlining some of these things can can be helpful uh, uh, as well because then once our once our factory is running or once our factory is working, we can write a spawn manager that uses the factory and then we can start actually creating some prefabs with our enemy with our melee enemies and our our. Uh, our ranged enemies and stuff. All right, so so we have these, and there's a couple of comments that uh, that come up here. So we have some products now. We have some concrete products now that our factory can produce. Uh, we're going to attach these to the appropriate prefab because enemy is a mono behavior. So that means that ranged enemy and melee enemy are also mono behaviors. So during your normal sort of inheritance rules. If enemy is a mono behavior, everything underneath it that inherits it is also a mono behavior. So there's, the, I don't have to, I don't have to put a comma and another mono behavior or something in here. The and me, melee enemy and ranged enemy will attach to game objects, so we don't have to worry about that. Now let's start looking at this enemy factory. If we made enemy factory a mono behavior, then we could attach it to a game object or even the same game object as our eventual spawn manager. And we wouldn't have to worry about a, uh, we wouldn't have to worry about a constructor and stuff because we could just make some public variables and drag some things in. Because I'm not going to have this be a model behavior. Again, we'll save that for the AI movement. We're going to create this more like we would create a regular Java class. A regular class that you're sort of used to from, from either Java or other languages. So we'll have some private uh, enemy prefabs. And the constructor will take prefabs from outside. So we'll send it a melee prefab, and we'll send the constructor a range prefab. And then we'll set, set those. So it looks more like a regular, uh, a regular class. You can throw other variables in here as well. So for an example, I have current wave. So maybe something changes in your factory depending on the wave that you're currently spawning. So you, know, you have some game where you spawn a wave, or spawn another wave, and another one, and then eventually your boss wave happens. So you could have some logic that determines what happens based on current wave. And this would normally be something, if you wrote this without a factory, this would be something that you'd have in the spawn manager. If you needed like a wave-based system, you put it in the spawn manager. But because we have it in the factory, our spawn manager doesn't need to know anything about a current wave that we're on. The factory takes care of it. And that's where some of this decoupling happens. The spawn manager it may not need to know what wave you're on. The spawn manager, its main purpose might just be to keep track of what is spawned in an array. And then every once in a while, add more things to that array. The factory can take over the job of keeping track of what should be spawned, the specific types of what should be spawned. So let's add some of this, let's, let's add a little bit of this code in, uh, and then we'll start, and then we'll mess around with the, uh, the I product. Uh, the, the the produce function. So back to my enemy factory. Let's throw in a couple of these. So we're going to have them be private, and they'll be of type enemy. And we'll just have the melee enemy prefab. And we'll have another one that is the uh, ranged enemy 
So I have a couple of those, and then our constructor. So I'll make it pretty explicit here, public enemy factory. And it will take in enemy, I'm going to say, I'm just going to name it something simple, melee and ranged. Like this. And then, of course, you know, you can just fill this in, this dot melee enemy prefab equals melee and ranged enemy prefab equals ranged. So just our initial setup, standard standard stuff here. Any other variables we need, the, the current wave one, we might have some probabilities or something. Let's make a, a public uh, int current wave. We might have, we, we may have some probabilities. We might have say, actually we probably make this private. And we can have another one that is float. And maybe this is the melee uh, spawn chance. And maybe this is 0.5 or something. So you can add whatever you want to in here. There can be whatever logic you need to determine what should be spawned. So maybe it's a 50-50 chance. Every time I produce an enemy, every time this factory creates an enemy, there's a 50-50 chance I get a melee. And there's a 50-50 chance, or there's a 50-50 chance total, it's either a melee or, or a range. So 50%. I can have functions in here to help that out. I can have functions in here that uh, are able to increment the wave every time something, every time a certain number of enemies spawn. So I might need to keep track of that. I can increment the wave. If I made this a mono behavior, you could do the same sort of thing. I could have these variables serialized or public or something. And then in the game object that this is attached to, I could mess around with those values. So there's nothing sort of inherently, inherently bad about using a regular class compared to a mono behavior. It's just for different places that you mess around with potentially some of the, the, the input values. Our spawn manager will instantiate an enemy factory and send in a melee and a ranged enemy to fill in these prefab spots. So that's how we're going to create an instance of this particular factory. All right, so, and I got a couple of these here. So a few sort of helper functions, we'll probably add some of that stuff in. Here's where some of the, uh, some of the actual logic stuff happens. So in the produce function, this is where you decide what should be returned. So I grade this float here, melee chance. I move that sort of out into class scope. So it's sort of the same thing. 50-50 chance to spawn a melee or, melee or ranged. Now, when I spawn an object, I need a position to spawn it in. I need an x and a y. So we'll create an x and a y value. We're just going to put it in a, a random location for now. That's something that you could easily change later. And I'm going to create a random number to check against the melee chance. So if the random number is less than or equal to melee chance, we spawn a melee prefab. Otherwise, we spawn a ranged pre prefab. This spawn function is something that we're going to write. So this isn't, uh, this isn't a unity function. This is something that we're, we're just about to write in, in, in a moment. If we don't hit any of these, of these of this if statements here, then I do, I do keep a return null in here. It might look a little weird because we know we we're guaranteed to hit one of these. We're never going to return null based on this, but it's useful because if you start mucking around with this and you start adding more 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 uh, enemies to spawn and you start putting different probabilities in, and now you're computing all sorts of stuff, it's useful to have it return null at the end, just in case you miss stuff. If you miss something and you do get a return null, then you can go back here and say, okay, I got a null from the factory. What's going on in my in my spawner here? Uh, so that's that's typically what uh, what I'll do. And there's other ways to write this. You could you could uh, you could probably just use one spawn and then do something with an array or something and set some values. But I think this is sort of more clear than than potentially some other ways to write it. And that's hope hopefully that I, I, try, I try to shoot for that. So hopefully that's uh, uh, clear enough. So let me uh, let me go in and do this. and start putting some stuff in here for the produce. So we have our melee spawn chance is, is 50%. So let's let's create the location where we are going to spawn this stuff. So have a float x, and we'll use the random.range. This, this is the Unity version of random. So this is the Unity engine 
version. So if if it tries to use the system version for you, you want to put Unity Engine dot in front of random here, and we'll do random dot range. And this is the the Unity coordinate system. So for now, we'll just have it spawn anywhere from 10 to 10 in both the X and the Y. So it might pop into the screen uh, like in, in an area that we're looking or something, but that's uh, that's fine for now. And then I'll have another one just, just called RAND, so it's a random number. And I'll just say random.range between uh, 0 and 1. Now we determine which one we're actually going to spawn. So we'll have our, our two sort of situations here. If rand is less than or equal to the melee spawn chance, then we're going to spawn our spawn melee, which we'll, we'll fill this out in a second after we write the, the, spawn, uh, uh, the spawn function. And I could put an else in here. I'm just going to leave it like this because you may want, for example, you may want to add a bunch more enemies, in which case you might have to write a bit more code to figure out which one to spawn. With two, it's easy. With uh, more than two, it starts to get a bit more complicated. So we'll just do this. Uh, and we'll say so the opposite way, we'll spawn a ranged. Otherwise, we return null. So we'll do this spawn here in, in, in just a second. The thing that I really want you to grasp from this, this sort of factory stuff is that the logic that's here in this produce function is something that you would put in your spawn manager if you didn't have a factory. So there's nothing sort of inherently new about this. It's just we've decoupled this logic from the spawn manager itself, the spawn manager that, that we're going to write. We've decoupled all of this. So all the spawn manager has to do, and, and I'm just going to throw this in. I'll, I'll delete it here in a second. But in the spawn manager that we still need to write, all we have to do is if is spawning, all we have to do is say, uh, say something like uh, enemy E equals factory dot factory. Okay, I'm gonna use a nice autocomplete here. Factory dot produce. That's it. That's all we're gonna have to do. The benefit to this, the real benefit to this, is that if we want to start spawning different things, let's say we go to a different level or we're in a different zone in our game now, all we have to do is change the factory. We change the factory, and thus we change all of this. That's the power here. You change the factory, you change how the spawning works, rather than changing a spawn manager, which might have a whole bunch of data. If I have 100 enemies spawned, uh, currently spawned in the game, if I needed to create a brand new spawn manager for every zone, that might be a problem. Whereas separating the logic from the actual instantiated things, the array that the spawn manager is keeping track of, allows me to just change the factory. So this this is one of the big the big benefits to this, and we're going to see that as we go on uh, and write our spawn manager and and actually see some uh, enemy spawning in the future. So let's write that uh, spawn function, and, and it's 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 very simple. It's basically just a wrapper. Uh, oops. It's basically just a wrapper around uh, instantiate. And here I have object on instantiate. I don't think you need that anymore. I think I wrote this slide or this this lecture before. Uh, you actually had to, had to do that. So I don't think you need this object dot instantiate anymore. So spawn is the thing that actually calls instantiate and it sends, it does the prefab, the X and Y position. We don't need the Z for our, our 2D game and the quaternion. So again, it's just a wrapper. It's not, it's not anything it's impressive. You could still use instantiate directly in the, uh, directly in the, in the produce if you want to, but uh, this gives you a a little bit less you have to uh, you have to type and you can keep using it uh, for all of your uh, for any sort of factory stuff that that you do uh, so let's go create that this one here I'm gonna have we could probably we could probably even make this private 
private i product spawn. And this is going to take an enemy. I'll call prefab and an X and a Y position. And all we're going to do is return instantiate uh, that is. I, ah, uh, yes, that, 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 that is why I have object in here. Uh, this is, this is not a mono behavior. Because it is not a mono behavior, you cannot use just instantiate. You have to say object dot instantiate. That's, that's why I've got it in there. Because you used to have to do this for anywhere. So anywhere in, in Unity, you just have to say object on, on instantiate. But uh, they got rid of it in mono behaviors, but not apparently in the just regular classes. So here's our instantiate. We need the object. So this is going to be the prefab. And we need a position. So this will be a new vector 3. And we're going to send in x, y, and 0. And then our uh, quaternion dot identity. So we send those in. It's OK to instantiate an enemy because enemies are mono behaviors. And that's what we instantiate. So that, that's why this works. That's why this is not a game object. It doesn't have to be a game object in here. And then for our melee spawn, we're just going to return spawn uh, melee enemy prefab x, y. And same thing here, except it will be the ranged enemy. So all of that logic that determines which one gets spawned is right here in our factory. Now, this this, this was a lot of work. And I talked about some of the, the, the sort of the power, the power of this. It was a lot of extra work. Don't get me wrong. We had to this one here. What we had to create some some interfaces and some concrete factory and make sure that we have our concrete products based on iProduct and all that kind of stuff. So that's why I might be asking, wow, this extra work. And even in classes like CS1 or CS2, when you see like two string, like why, why don't we got to write this two string thing? Can I just write a print method? So it's, it's, it's that same sort of thing. This factory pattern, it's going to allow us to separate, in this case, the instantiation that would normally be in a spawn manager. It's going to let us separate that out into the factory itself so that the manager the spawn manager does not know the type of enemies that exist in the game. Think about what we're returning here. We're returning an I product. It's not even an enemy. It's a product. Now, we're going to make some assumptions in the spawn manager that we will produce enemies. But the spawn manager will never know what type of enemy it is. There's a 50-50 chance to, 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 do a, to, to do a melee or a ranged. The spawn manager doesn't know. And, and the, the, I suppose the good question is, does it need to care? Does it matter that it doesn't know? And I'm going to argue, and as, of course, as we go through the rest of the, of the spawn manager code and stuff, I'm going to argue that no, we don't need, the spawn manager does not need to know the type of enemies that, that, that have spawned. The spawn manager's job is to keep track of an array of enemies and add them to the list and remove them from the list, but not to care which ones it actually is. And the spawn manager keeps that array because we need to do things with those enemies. Every single enemy needs to know where the player is, and every single enemy needs to do its movements and all of its sort of normal stuff. So that's why we're keeping a list of all these enemies. But the spawn manager is not going to know. It's not going to know what enemies they are. And even if it's a boss enemy that we'll, that we'll add into this factory later, it doesn't really need to know about that either because the boss is going to do its own thing. It's got its own, it's going to have its own state machine. It's going to, it's going to do its own thing. It just needs to know that. Just the spawn manager just needs to know that, yeah, th there's an enemy here, and it needs to do stuff. Which enemy it is, doesn't matter. And again, changing the spawn behavior is easy to do. We might have something in here that's maybe based on the current wave. So I could have something like, uh, let's see, melee spawn chance. 
uh, plus equals whatever whatever it currently is. Uh, yeah, sorry, plus equals, so that's uh, what our currently is. Uh, and maybe it's based on, so we add the current wave uh, divided by 10 or something. And so the spawn chance here, the melee spawn chance goes up as the current wave goes up. Right now the current wave is zero, so it's just 50-50. But maybe it continues to go up as the current wave changes. Now, if I had a different set of enemies that I needed to spawn, say I was on world two or something, and I had a separate, completely different set of en enemies. I don't have the same range and, 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 and melee enemies. And there's some totally different configuration I want to use for how they spawn and where they spawn on the screen and, and all of that. Or I want to have some specific set of enemies that I spawn. Like I want three ranged enemies for the first wave and two for the second wave and so on. I could just have a different factory. I could have a factory called a World 2 Enemy Factory. And it would have all the appropriate stuff that it needs. And in my spawn manager, again, I just swap the factory, and now everything spawns like it's supposed to. I don't have to change the spawn manager in any way to get it to work. And so every single new world or new set of spawn parameters I need, I just create a different factory, and I'm good to go. From a mono behavior perspective, this could mean swapping the, the components in the mono behavior. If, if the factory was a mono behavior, you just swap the component out. In this situation where it's not a mono behavior, we just have to instantiate the appropriate factory at the appropriate time. And then we use that factory from, from then on. So, so, so Andy, I'm being very, uh, I'm being, I'm being very uh, general. So for us, we are spawning enemies. Our I factory here could be this, this could be enemy. But because I would put, if I put enemy in the, in the interface here for iFactory, that means that all of my factories must produce enemies. But I might have other factories that produce power-ups or extra life or even just sort of random stuff like, uh, I don't know, falling boulders in a video, in a, in a, in a thing or something. So they, I may not want all of them to produce enemies, and all of my factories are going to be of the I factory type. So by changing this to I product, it can be as general as possible. This does have consequences later on. We are actually in our spawn manager. We actually will have to do a cast from I product to enemy. That's not ideal, and we'll talk about ways that you can that 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 you might be able to mitigate that. But as a general factory, it just a general factory produces a product. And anything we, that we say is a product, a factory should be able to return to us. So I could make a power up factory and have that as an additional factory that returns a product. But this time, it's a power up prefab. So that's, that's, that's sort of, sort of uh, the, the reason why. I try to make it as general as possible. The enemy, the concrete enemy factory will only be doing stuff with, with enemies. But we still have to follow our, our I product. And in principle, we we could we might be able to get away with doing a conversion to like game object or something. So rather than I product, we could just allow any factory to return a game object. That could also work. That is sort of a way around this whole thing because if we're spawning something, if our intention is to instantiate something, then it's going to be a game object in the end anyway. So we could probably use game object here as well. And then those are things that you know if it fits what you're trying to do, then then definitely you'll feel free to, to, to mess around with it and, and sort of see if, see if it'll work for you. But this, is, this one is sort of as general as possible for our, our enemy factory. So, uh, so, so on our slides here, this is useful, and that's sort of what I've been, what I've been talking about as well, is that, yeah, if you want to change what enemies are spawning, create a new factory, create as many as you want. And it goes even further than that. What if you want to make an, a spawner enemy? What if you want to make an enemy that spawns little enemies? that go and attack you. You could just add a factory to that enemy. You'd have to hook it up in some way to the spawn manager, most likely, depending on how you wanted to deal with it. But you could just add a factory to that enemy, and now that enemy just calls the produce from the factory whenever it needs to spawn something. Whenever it should spawn a little guy out of its, I don't know if you have sort of a big sort of zombie type thing, maybe it spawns little flies that goes and attacks, and attacks the player or something. 
And so you just have a, a fly factory or another enemy factory that only instantiates flies. And you add that to the actual enemy itself, to the boss enemy or whatever. So the fact that they're modular and you can create as many of them as you want in any sort of, that sort of do this in any way that you want is what makes them powerful. So it's not sort of a, it's, it's not, it's not that we do it because it looks fancy or it's, or it's, you know, it's, it's more code. So it makes it look like you look, look like, look like you've done more work or something. It's because you get a lot of flexibility out of it. And you could really apply this to most games that, that folks make. If you went back to your uh, volcano Island, where you have some fireballs spawning and you also have some heart stuff spawning, you could add a factory that just spawns those things and you could have a probability you know a five percent chance that you get a heart on any given spawn and the rest is the fireball and all spawner needs to do is produce so there's a lot of sort of nice ways to to use this so i highly encourage encourage you to, to take a look at some other examples of this of this sort of factory online obviously we'll be using it i don't think it's in the game does the game programming patterns book i don't think he talked about the the factory there but this is a very common uh, a very common uh, uh, pattern. Uh, we actually even did this uh, this style of pattern in some of the nuclear physics stuff that I was doing. Our factory wasn't anything sort of physically related. It was the type of solver we were using. So we had a factory that during runtime, based on what the user sort of entered in their in the input file, uh, it would either spawn a GPU solver or a CPU solver or an MPI solver. So it would spawn a specific solver using the factory, and then none of the other code has to change. The factory just decides what uh, what the actual spawner or what the actual solver was, and the rest of the code doesn't care. It just runs the uh, it just runs the the stuff from the product. So even in those sort of more abstract situations, this the system can work. Anytime you have the possibility of needing to have more than one thing at any given moment, a factory can potentially work for you. So, so I do recommend potentially looking up a bit more into this. And of course, we will use it as, as we go along, uh, as we go along with, with the project. So I didn't anticipate this one taking too long. Uh, if, if you're looking at the slides and the PDF, you're, you know that we're, we're, we're basically finished uh, for, for today. Um, I sort of broke up the lectures a little bit more for, for this one because I didn't want to go sort of too fast and sort of add too much at any, at any given moment. So I think next time, uh, the enemies and the projectiles are, are what's coming up. And along with the enemies, that's when we'll start thinking about that movement AI that I was talking about. So uh, how are we going to get the enemies to stop some distance away from the player so they, can, so they can shoot? Or how are we get the melee enemies to always chase them? So we'll look at how that some, of that's, some of that stuff gets set up in our enemy classes. We'll also make some projectiles. The range enemy needs a projectile. This time, we're not going to use a particle system for the projectile. We will be using just a regular you know, instantiate a game object that shoots out away from the enemy. So there's some strips that sort of go along with that as well. So that that is that is basically all, all that I have for today. Hopefully, this, this factory pattern wasn't sort of too opaque, too complicated. Uh, once we write the spawn manager, I think it'll start to become a, a bit more clear. At least I hope it starts to become uh, a bit more clear. So that is it. So uh, yeah, I will see you guys uh, next Tuesday for some more uh, enemy stuff. Uh, have a good weekend. Thanks, Professor. Have a good one. Yep. Yeah.